every healthy house has to have a healthy living room. This is the place where we do everyday life. What causes healthy relationships, healthy fun, healthy activities? What does the living room of our lives look like? I'm so excited to talk with you about the living room today. Pastor Dwight gave us such a profound and powerful message last weekend on the kitchen and the things we consume and guidelines that we all need to have for our lives. Well, the living room is such a great assignment for me because I have such fond memories of our living room growing up. I was in a family of seven kids, and we lived in our living room. It wasn't unusual for my parents to come into our living room and have all seven of us crammed on the couch, even though there was other furniture in the living room. We're all together with our legs intertwined. We're eating and we're bantering, and it was just a, a great place to do life. Um, the furniture in our living room was meant to be moved, and so we moved it all the time. We was constant thing where I would uh, lay down a wide uh, winter scarf and that was my balance beam and my mom would sit on the couch and I would do my my balance beam routine and she'd say do that again point your toes this time and this do that again otherwise you're gonna fall off when you actually do it on the beam and we would practice and practice um, I'd be sitting in the living room on the couch and my dad would come in I just lost my dad in January so this memory is so sweet to me um, but he would put on an Andy Williams record or an Elvis record and he would reach out his hand and he'd have me stand up. I'd put my books down and he would twirl me around and, and he would dance with me. It was so, so precious. Um, my parents could move. I mean, my mom could move. My dad just kind of did this thing, you know. But, and she'd do the sugar foot all the way around him. He just, you know, and uh, so, so they would on the weekends oftentimes move the furniture. There was four girls and three boys and they would pair us up and they taught us all the oldies, the, the Lindy and the Jitterbug and the Sugarfoot. And so they would, it was so amazing. So it wasn't unusual to drive by our house and see one of my brothers flipping us sisters, you know, around the back. And, and uh, it, was, it was fun. It was the place where I would dream with my mom about some of the things I wanted to be when I grow up. It was the place where my mom sat my sister and I down on the couch and said, girls, just because your brother chased you with the BB gun doesn't give you the right to squirt honey in his bath towel when he's in the shower. <laughs> and we're like, but we were busted. Anyway, it's a place where we received correction and direction, and we laughed and we cried, and we absolutely did life. And I had a girlfriend who was so put together, so perfect looking all the time, her hair, her clothes, just to the T, always played at my house, and I always wanted to go to her house. And just to give you kind of an example of how what contrasting we were, with seven kids in our family, we had a sock basket. I thought everybody had a sock basket. You just grabbed two socks. Really didn't see the point of your socks needing to match, unless, as long as they were the same thickness, you know, because that can feel, that can throw you off a little bit. <laughs> but and she would always ask me, why don't your socks match? And I'm like, why do yours? I mean, how do you, how do you swing that, you know? Anyway, she, finally I got her to let me go play at her house. And it was perfect. And literally, in our living room, the carpet was worn down from the places we danced or where I tumbled. And uh, so I get into her living room. I see her living room at the distance. And there's a piano and beautiful vases. And it was the most, like something you'd see in a magazine. And I see her living room. And I'm running to go in it. And she goes, stop, 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 stop. And I stop like this before I go into her living room. She goes, it's only for looks. Nobody go in there. And, and she got very nervous. And I learned that much of her house was that way and the relationships within the home were that way, and eventually the marriage broke up and the family fell apart. My sons are grown now, all grown up in their 20s, and I think back to our living room, and that was the place where we would bring correction, bring direction, we'd laugh, we'd play, we'd dream. That was the place where my sons played their favorite game with their dad, and it was the pillow game, and they would run across the living room, and he would try to take them out by throwing a pillow at their feet. <laughs> I know that's illegal now, but it, you know, this was <laughs> 20 years ago. The living room is the place where you do life. And I'm gonna talk about three scenarios of doing life with God. The first is the facade. It's the perfect looking living room that's not lived in. It's when what appears to man matters more than what appears to God. Then there's the functional living room. It kind of doubles as an office where you boil down your relationship with God as what you do for him and what he does for you. 
And just a side note, God is not a means to an end. He's the beginning and the end. And the third is continual fellowship. It's the lived-in living room. It's the place where we cultivate intimacy with God. It's the place where he corrects us when we need it, when he heals us when we need it, when he speaks life to us when we need it, when he replenishes us. It's the place we play and dream and get reset. Facade. Facade is an outward appearance that is maintained to conceal a less pleasant, incredible reality. Outward appearance. So open up your Bibles if you have them, otherwise there'll be a slide on the screen. This is Luke 11, verses 37, 38. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So he went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. This hand-washing ceremony was not a God-given law, it was a man-made tradition. And the original intent was to identify the, the Jewish people as a set-apart people. But by the time Jesus' day came around, that action was more of spiritual superiority. It's to, to isolate from the common folk. And so if they bumped into a Samaritan, if they bumped into a Gentile in the marketplace, they had to wash themselves off. Am I, do I have a bloody nose all of a sudden? Okay, good. It suddenly felt like, wouldn't that be the worst? I mean, wouldn't you hate that? Anyway, sorry. Sorry. I'll regret this tomorrow. I know that. But anyway. But I want you to imagine if you met somebody, you shook their hand, and right after they said, how you doing? They went like this. And then they got some sanitizer out. And they're like, you know, get my purse strap. I think that bumped up against them, too. That is literally what the Pharisees did. They washed the cups. They washed the forks. Anything to get themselves, to get the eh off of them. So don't you love that Jesus would not do that? He gets to the table, and he's like, I'm not disassociating from the people I came to save. Not doing it. Don't you love that? I'm not doing it. In fact, he took it a step further, and he says, you, Pharisees, you're like whitewashed tombs and unmarked graves. In an unmarked grave, if you came in contact with an unmarked grave unknowingly, you defiled yourself. So he's telling these Pharisees, I'm not only not disassociating with these people that you think defile me, that I love, that I came to save, but when people come in contact with you, they defile themselves. That's audacity, isn't it? And then further on in uh, chapter 12, this is what he says to his disciples. Meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands were milling about and stepping on each other. And Jesus turned first to his disciples, and he warned them. So he's got this conflict that's fresh in his mind and this concern for his disciples. So he leans in and warns them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven is something that starts here, and it grows. And the translation is here is that it corrupts. It grows in its corruption. Beware of the leaven. What's the leaven? Hypocrisy. Isn't that amazing? Beware of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy defiles the work of the kingdom because it defiles us. Yeast grows, it spreads, and when how you appear to man matters more than how you appear to God, your spiritual life gets corrupted. What does that look like in everyday life? When you care more about what others think than what God thinks. That's the fear of man. When you aim more to impress than to bless. When you take the seat of honor rather than giving it to someone else. When you get your value from your associations versus your identification with the living God. When you refuse to give, forgive because you've been forgiven. When you harbor anger. When you feel proud of your strengths, but you judge others on their weaknesses. When you spend more time critiquing others than you do praying, have mercy on me. What in me, Lord? Do not underestimate the power of hip hypocrisy because it is what diminishes our witness to a lost and dying world. What is the number one thing you hear from people who hate Christians? All hypocrites. Now the truth is we all, we all are sinners deeply in need of grace. And this is not to be confused with people who are in process, on our way, God's redeeming us and sanctifying us as we go. We're sincere, we fall down, we get buck up. Totally different than a willful facade to present different than we actually are. Hypocrisy is what makes weaker brothers and sisters in the faith stumble, and it's what opens the door to the enemy to destroy us. It defiles and disrupts. You know, there is much duplicity in the kingdom of God today. And as you see all around you, things are being shaken. And as scripture says, God allows that so that what cannot be shaken can be clearly seen. Enemy is out to take out marriages, take out churches, take out organizations, bring exposure. And we need to close the gaps and shut him down. 
He's waiting for just the right time to trip us up. We need to fear God, have a healthy fear enough of God to walk in integrity before him, to care more what he thinks than what others think about us. Warren Wearsby wrote these words, when a believer is out of the will of God, he becomes a troublemaker and not a peacemaker. Lot moved to Sodom and brought trouble on his family. David committed adultery and brought trouble on his family and his kingdom. Jonah disobeyed God and almost sent a shipload of heathen sailors to a watery grave. We all have this dueling nature within us, but we've got to know that and keep ourselves before the Lord. Francis Frangipane interprets that passage, I think it's in Luke, about bearing fruit and keeping with repentance. He says, keep with repentance till you're bearing fruit in the very area of your weakness and your stumbling. So if you constantly find yourself caring more what people think than what God thinks, that's so, just get on your knees and say, God, here I am again. Help me fear you above man. Help me to be bold with men because I'm much with you. Bring it to the Lord until you're bearing fruit. Guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. That's facade. Number two is function. Now, just to be clear, we do have a purpose. We do have a mission as believers. When you said yes to Jesus, in fact, before you even said yes to Jesus, before you were born, God had a purpose and a song written over your life. He had stuff for you to do. But you're not the mission. You were made first and foremost for him, for relationship. I mean, if most of us are honest, we don't have kids to have a bunch of little slaves, right? Because we want to love them. We want to have a relationship. They got a call in their life. There's chores to do once in a while. That's not why we had them, though. First and foremost, we belong to him. First and foremost, we are to say, I am my beloved's, and he is mine. And his banner over me is love. And out of that intimate place comes a mission, comes a call, comes a purpose. But we're not the mission. We're someone he loves. And if you put more weight on the function of this relationship, on what you do for God and what he does for you, you are going to be susceptible to burnout. You're going to be susceptible to discouragement, to pride and self-righteousness, to put so much more weight, as I said, on what you do than on what he's already done. And you know what? The time will come. Well, crisis will hit. And you'll be really disillusioned with God. And the temptation will be to pull that card out of your back pocket and go, wait a minute here. I've done all this stuff for you. That doesn't even come into your mind when you're living out of response to his love. That I love because he first loved me. I'm just living in response to what he's already done for me. But you start to get your weight onto all of your service. And you neglect intimacy with God. You start to think it's more about you than it is about him. When you're in function mode and you're suddenly thrust into a season of obscurity, which happens to every serious follower of Christ, where you feel cut off from the world, maybe even misunderstood by them, and you're in a wilderness place and you feel like your purpose has been removed for a season, if you're in function mode, that place will feel like an utter waste of time. And you'll feel like, uh, hello, God, I got stuff to do out here. But if you understand that you're never out of his reach and nothing can separate you from his love, and you find yourself in a season of obscurity, you may go into that place kicking and screaming, but you'll come out leaning on the arm of your beloved. You'll learn in that place some of your most valuable lessons, that you're not what you do, you're someone who loves. In those places of obscurity is where he purifies our motives, where he sanctifies our desires, where he helps us to learn to rest in him, where he reminds us again, you're not what you do, you're someone I love. The thing is, as I said, I want to stress it again. As we walk closely with the Lord, there's a very important call in our life. But first and foremost, we're his. In the book of Revelations, the Spirit is talking to the church of Ephesus. And they were sound in doctrine, hard workers. Probably said two or three times in that passage, you labored hard, you worked hard, you guarded the word, you didn't tolerate evil, but I have this against you. You lost your first love. Your first love. And you know what he says? Repent. And look how far you've fallen. Isn't that interesting? You're a hard, hard worker guarding your doctrine, but you've fallen. Because our efforts can't save us. Our efforts cannot sustain us. So when we shift our way to our efforts and our hard labor and service, we've fallen. We rest in the shadow of the Most High God, and out of that place, miracles happen. So he says, repent and return. Otherwise, I'll remove the light from your lampstand. And you know what? There are churches today that are functioning, working, working hard, but they've lost their first love. But the church that's a city on a hill, the person that's a city on a hill, is the one who's afire with the love of God. And out of that place, service flows. Amen? He saved us because he loved us. Let's look at Luke 10, verses 18, 20. I'm going to set this up. So, 
When you walk intimately with God, you're going to do great things. You're going to see miracles happen and have an expectancy that that will happen. You're going to do stuff that's above and beyond your skill level because the kingdom of God is moving in and through you. The, the disciples, same thing. They run back to Jesus. Demons are obeying us. Miracles are happening. Lord, Lord, you got to hear some of our stories of the stuff we're doing in your name. And you think Jesus would jump up and down and say, I told you so, I told you, isn't this great? But no, he gave them a cautionary word, and this is the word. He told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. You can walk among snakes and scorpions, and you can crush them. Nothing will injure you, but... Do not rejoice because the evil spirits obey you. Rejoice, another translation says marvel because your name is written in the book of life. This is so important. If the wonder of what you get to do for God upstages the wonder of what he's already done, you've lost your way. We get to do great things, but marvel every day that Jesus is saying here that I saved you. That's the greatest miracle of all. I was lost and now I'm found. I was a sinner, I'm redeemed. I was an orphan. I'm in a royal lineage now. Isn't that amazing? If you marvel every day that he saved you, and out of that place, he can entrust you with the riches of heaven and do great things through you. Daily marvel that he saved you. The Bible says, cease striving and know that he is God. The translation in the word know there is yada, and you know what it means? Intercourse. Such intimacy that you're one. So if you get into a place where you are striving, the Bible is saying, stop your striving and reaffirm your oneness with God. Get intimate with him again. Scripture is clear that some who work for the Lord, he'll say, I don't know you. Some of us know him and we still get into striving, and that's why that passage is there. Repent, cease striving, know that he is God. But there's others who said, but we did, we we." You know, spoke to demons. We did miracles. He's like, I don't know you. I don't know you. Jesus is going to come back someday, and he's very clear that the wheat is growing up with the tares, those who look like the real deal and those who are the real deal. He knows who's who in the zoo, right? He knows who are his. He says, I know who are mine. And you might be someone who nurtures an intimate walk of faith, and nobody else notices you for anything. But you know him, and he knows you, and you both know it. Isn't that a wonder when you think about it? That is where life happens. By being intimately connected to the vine, fruit happens. We don't produce more by doing more. We produce more by being more in Christ. Is your first love the most important thing in your life? As I said, if you walk intimately with God and if the miracle of his grace has saved you, changes you, you are his, he is yours, and you both know it. You're not what you do, you're someone he loves. But out of that love, great stuff happens. But if you're in function mode, and you get driving too hard, you get out ahead of God, you're running the risk of opening yourself up to the wiles of the enemy. In our travels, we get to meet lots of great pastors and church leaders, great friends. And I wrote this letter to a pastor recently. And I felt impressed to read it today because maybe it's for one of you. Here it is. Dear friend, I've wanted to send you a note for some time, but I wasn't sure if I should or not. But God continually brings you to mind, so I decided to take the risk and jump. Though the Lord keeps bringing you to mind, I'm not saying for a moment that what I'm about to share is a thus saith the Lord message to you. It's just something that's on my heart for you, and I pray for your grace as I try to share my thoughts. About 15 years ago, in our early 30s, Kevin and I were on overdrive, doing all kinds of good things, ministry things. But we were driving hard, running parallel paths, and were wearing ourselves out. A very distinguished woman, whom I just was getting to know at the time, asked me out to lunch. We sat across the table from one another, and we chatted. Then she leaned in, and what she said next about knocked me over. She proceeded to tell me that both she and her hubby were overachievers, which I already knew. And they, too, had run on overdrive for far too long. But something happened that turned their lives upside down. He messed up morally in such a public way that he brought humiliation on their whole family. It was so devastating, and it seemed to them like it came out of nowhere. They were trying to put the pieces back together when she asked me out to lunch. She said, Susie, I'm quite sure that neither Kev nor you have any thoughts or secret desires to step off of God's best path for you, but I see the weariness in your eyes, and I know we have a fierce opponent as an enemy. He'll wait for just the right time, and he will trip you up, or he'll trip up Kevin. He intends to take you out. 
God has put you on my heart time and time again, and I'm telling you, warning you, please step back, get some rest, reset, and put some firmer boundaries around your marriage, your life, and your time. That lunch date put a whole new fear of God in me. I believe she saved us from some kind of devastation, and I praise God for her courage. We were racing toward burnout at the time, and that was one of the many messages God used to put us right. We've never let up from certain marriage and time boundaries since then. So here's what I want to say to you, friend. You have God-given leadership abilities, but you're worn out, and you seem a little jaded by this ministry thing. I was there too, and you're physically tired. Your sweet wife is weary and needs you. Here's my charge to you, friend. Pull back. Reignite your love affair and intimacy with the Lord and your wife and your family and get back in shape physically. Make everything else get in line and take a number. I promise that if you seek first the kingdom and guard first your marriage and family and your physical health, you will last long and finish strong and be established in God's best for you. A while back, I had a guest on the show who had a similar story as my friend, except she was the one who had an affair. Again, I'm not saying you're close to falling in that way, but we all have ways we can fall and miss the mark. Anyway, this was a great show, and I mentioned this lunch during the show. Listen in, if you would. God bless you, brother. I believe with all my heart that God wants to nourish, revive, and reset you in ways that feel wonderful to you and protect all that you love. Kevin and I are seeing once very godly marriages dropping like flies all around us. It's caused us to close the ranks on our own marriage even more and to be bolder when it comes to our friends. And we're enjoying our marriage now more than ever. And we're stronger in ministry now more than ever. I do believe it's because of those changes we made all those years ago. I welcome your thoughts or any response you want to give me. I do hope you know that I come to you in brotherly love. God bless you, bud. And praise God, he responded the way that I hoped he would, with humility and sincerity and thankfulness, because he was on his road to burnout. I did a show recently on that Beth Moore book, When Godly People Do Ungodly Things. I read this letter, and we talked about shoring our lives up because the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. I had one woman call and said, I thought the burden of obedience would be tougher than the burden and consequence of my sin, so I had the affair. And let me tell you, the burden of the consequence is far, far greater than the burden of my obedience. When we get striving and we get going in our own strength, we expose ourselves to the wiles of the enemy. Recently, I had Pastor Wilson, author, best-selling author, Pete Wilson, on the show, and I asked him this question. How do you know the difference between striving too hard for God and being earnestly engaged with God? He said this, You're striving when you're so busy that you run over your family in the process. And when your commitments cost them dearly, you need to stop and reprioritize. Isn't that a good word? So what's the answer here? I think it's in James 4, 7. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God, translated, it's a military term, get back in rank. And I think that's a really good picture. Say you're a private and you're destined to be a general someday, so you're getting out ahead of God, striving in your own strength. That's when you expose yourself to the enemy. God doesn't, his plan never contradicts himself. So you're going to work hard, you're going to steward the gifts God gave you, but they never contradict your other priorities of a godly family, of nurturing your relationships. So you get back into rank. Lord, I got out ahead of you. I'm submitting your t- my timing to your will. You submit to God. Then you resist the devil. And I want you to picture the devil. He's waiting to pounce. He's waiting to chase you down. He's waiting to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the word says. But you get back into rank. You're more powerful as a private under God's authority than you are a wannabe general outside of his will. Amen? You get back into rank. You submit to God. Then you go, devil, you can't have my marriage. You can't have my family. You can't have my country. You can't have my church. Suddenly you've got authority and you resist the devil. This devil who is chasing you down, the next part of that verse says he will flee from you. Do you know the translation of flee? Escape for his life. Don't you just love the idea of him scurrying away like a little rat? Get on now. I'm back in rank. That is your protection. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Continual fellowship. That's the third one. That's what we're made for. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I did a word study on that delight word, and it means a number of things, but the three that stuck out to me remind me of some of the times I had with my girlfriend. One is pamper yourself. Pamper yourself in the Lord. The point being here, Any gift he could give us pales in comparison to the treasure of knowing his heart. So to pamper yourself in the Lord 
is to put on some worship music, lay on the couch, and just be with him because he's that great. Or however it is you nurture your soul, just to hang out with God. Another one is make sport of. In other words, acknowledge him in every wonderful, fun thing you get to do because the Bible says every good gift comes from God. So for me, when I ride my bike on my trails, it's one 25-mile worship experience for me. But don't compartmentalize your faith to Sundays only. Every good gift comes from him. So acknowledge, delight in him because he gave you that moment. And the third one is remember and dream together. Remember the ways God has come through for you and dream about the ways he'll come through for you again. That's delight. That's relationship. That works in marriage, really works in your walk with God. As you delight in him, his desires become your desires, and he will establish you. And in that intimate place, in that living room where you do life with God, miracles are, are achieved, conceived. Your dream is conceived in intimacy, and it's achieved in intimacy. And you will live another worldly life. George Mueller is one of my faith heroes, and that man had such an intimate walk with God in the private place that he had a very public, powerful ministry. And here's the short story as I get ready to wrap up of a man who came in contact with George Mueller. Listen to this. A number of years ago, I went to America with a steamship captain who was a very devoted Christian. When we were off the coast of Newfoundland, he said to me, the last time I sailed here, which was five weeks ago, something happened that revolutionized my entire Christian life. I'd been on the bridge for 24 straight hours when George Mueller of Bristol, England, who was a passenger on board, came to me and said, Captain, I love his audacity, Captain, I need to tell you that I must be in Quebec on Saturday afternoon. That's impossible, I replied. Very well, Mueller responded. If your ship cannot take me, God will find some other way, for I have never missed an engagement in 57 years. Come now, let's go down to the chart room and pray. He's talking to the captain. I love this. I looked at this man of God and thought to myself, what lunatic asylum did he escape from? <laughs> I had never encountered someone like this. Mr. Mueller, I said, do you not realize how dense the fog is? Listen to his answer. No. My eye is not on the dense fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of my life. He then knelt down and prayed one of the most simple prayers I have ever heard. When he'd finished, I started to pray, but he put his hand on my shoulder and told me not to pray. First, you do not believe God will answer. Second, I believe he already has. Consequently, there's no need whatsoever for you to pray about it. <laughs> As I looked at him, he said, Captain, I have known my Lord for 57 years, and there has never been a single day that I have failed to get an audience with the king. Get up, Captain, and open the door, and you will see that fog is gone. I got up, and indeed, the fog was gone. And on Saturday afternoon, George Mueller was in Quebec for his meeting, and that's how it's done. Hallelujah. God has dreams for you, but his greatest dream is to walk closely with you. And maybe you're in a place where you've been hiding a sin, where you've been presenting one way and guarding your stuff in the dark. Or maybe you've just been striving in your own strength. Or maybe you've been enjoying continual fellowship, whatever the case. God wants you to move in, and he wants to move in, and he wants to narrow the gap and walk intimately with you. Let's pray. We hope you enjoyed today's program. We would love to have you join us for one of our Sunday morning services at 9 or 11 a.m. For more information, you can visit us on the web at emmanuelcc.org.